I will go on. I will go on right now and continue the romantic poetry. Romantic, uh, romantic poetry, there is an introduction that I'd like you to join me in following what we are talking about. An attitude. Listen to this. It is an attitude. We are talking of attitude. We have an attitude towards the world, towards the people, towards everything, right? It's an attitude or intellectual orientation. Intellectual orientation. Look how we talk about romanticism here. Characterizing many works of literature, painting, music, architecture, criticism, and historiography in Western civilization. That is the, 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 the first paragraph that I Romanticism no, can be seen as a rejection of the precepts, precepts, mandur, mandur, of order, calm, harmony, balance, idealism or idealization, and rationality. These characteristics that we talked about a moment ago Typify what? Typify classism. In general, what's a classism talking about? It is talking about harmony. It is talking about order. It's talking about balance, idealism, or idealization, rationality. Late 18th century neoclassism also, in particular, is known to have all of these, you know, combined in the nature of poetry. And that is paragraph two. Let's go to the paragraph three. In the return, as we say that this is all about, not about romanticism, but about uh, neoclassism and about uh, classic classism, etc., etc. But romanticism emphasized the individual okay we are not talking collectively we're not talking about the the whole community sharing all these attributes no we're talking about the individual we're talking about the subjective the irrational the imaginative the personal the spontaneous and again back to the emotional the visionary and Transcendental. I emphasize the word visionary because our poet that we are going to deal with is a visionary one. Okay? If we're talking about the Blake, the Blake is a visionary one. All right? So we'll do that at transcendental. That's again next paragraph. Now, what else we need here? Hmm? Before we get to Blake, what else we need? We need to say something. Okay. Okay, okay, okay. Wait, wait, wait. Oh, 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 oh. My goodness. What page? Uh, I think the pages are enumerated, so we can go back to the pages before we go to the lamb. And before we go through these, I don't know what happened to okay. romanticism, romantic poetry signify. Listen to this. This is the romantic poetry, and this is the late 18th century to the mid 19th century. That is the period where romantic poetry sort of covered. One a deepened appreciation or appreciation as you like of the beauties of nature that's number one two a general exaltation or exaltations of the ocean of a reason no reason emotion that's what is needed uh, here okay before we get into the two poems okay 
I'm going to continue with romanticism and the romantic poetry, what it signifies, all right? What it signifies. A deepened appreciation of the beauties of nature, number one. Number two, a general exaltation of emotion over reason, and of the senses over intellect. Then number three, a turning in upon the self. What is this, a turning in upon the self? And a heightened examination of what? Of a human personality. A turning in, a turning in upon the self. It's very interesting, even the, the, the wording of this sentence. Turning in upon the self, that is me and only me, the individual, okay? The subjective, then examination, a full examination of a human is going on around us, all right? We continue then, we continue with number four, a preoccupation with the genius. Genius now. The hero second and the exceptional figure in general. Only, only about the exceptional. Only about the genius we are talking. Okay? Only about the hero. This is romanticism and a focus on this person's passions this person's inner struggles and when i say person i mean female or male both and number five a new view of the artist here we go the artist is completely different seen in a different color in a different uh, uh, vision now the artist is supremely or a supremely individual creator See, why is it supremely individual creator? This is not easy to talk about. Then we get to six now. We get to six, my friend. We get to six. What's it saying? An emphasis upon imagination. All the time, when we talk about the romanticism, we talk about the imagination. Okay? Imagination, a gateway to transcendent experience and spiritual truth. This is very, very, very interesting. Transcendent, look how much he emphasizes, or oh, the other wrote these, these, these lines, emphasizes transcendency. You transcend, you transcend the experience. And you go to the spiritual truth. Obsessive interest in folk culture. Always looking for the folk culture. Okay, not the elite. Not the elite. You know the, the meaning of the elite. No, we're not talking about the elite. We're, we're talking about the, the, the you know, the, just like uh, Elijah written in the country churchyard. He, he noticed how he associated, how the, the poet has associated himself with the humble, okay? Same thing here. The romantic here is turning toward the folk culture. Folks, you are with me. Folk culture, okay? National and ethnic cultural origins, again, and the medieval era seems to be very much interesting that the romantics are very much interested in the medieval era. Number eight is a tendency, and there is a tendency in this kind of poetry, a tendency among these poets who are romantics. Well, for what? For the, for the exotic, and you know what I mean by the exotic. The exotic, not normal, okay? The remote, not near not within hands, not within reach. The mysterious, the weird, the occult, the monstrous, and even the satanic. Listen to this, satanic, and I told you about our, our poet, whom we are going to deal with very, 
recently who talks about uh, uh, the the, the, the uh, proverbs of hell, all right? Or the marriage of paradise and hell, heaven and hell. Imagine this 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 satanic aspect that uh, tries uh, you know that is almost somehow uh, coloring the romantic poetry of this era all right now what we are going to see after number eight we are getting to william blake you are there and i'm sure you will enjoy this artist and his two poems and hopefully that prepare prepare the two poems and i'll give you some time to read these two poems and to tell what is it about how is it <clears throat> okay how is it uh, uh, figured out or how, or how is it exposed to us the guy was born in 1757 and passed away 1827, 70 years almost. Okay, an English romantic artist and poet. Listen, the first characteristic about this individual is that he's a, an English romantic artist and poet. He was trained as a painter and engraver and he spent most of his career commissioned works of art we should, should, should we should say commissioning works of art he also published his poetry along with his own illustration imagine he normally any, any poem he illustrates in a fiery fiery engraving okay so illustrations is very important and part and parcel of his poetry. The most famous of his illustrated poems are the lamb and the tiger. Look at the tiger. Look at the tiger. Okay. It's written differently, but uh, now, okay, we take it as it is, which are also most representative of his great literary works hmm? songs of innocence and songs of experience box songs of innocence and song of experience hmm? how is that what do you tell me what is that what does it what does it tell you? Songs of innocence and songs of experience jumbled together, taken together. Okay, let's start with the lamb. I think we have read the lamb. Okay, few lines, few lines of poetry. But my goodness, the title is well intentioned lamb well intentioned and the and the, and underline the this the lamb symbolizes jesus we didn't say christ we say we say jesus the lamb symbolizes jesus the traditional image of jesus as a lamb emphasizes the christian values of gentleness that's the first thing a humbleness and finally peace these are what these are characteristics of the lamb at the beginning of the poem pay attention to the speaker the way he talks the way he speaks okay the speaker a child asks a rhetorical question What's rhetorical questions? I do not anticipate an answer from you. That's what, it, what the meaning of rhetorical. That is, I ask the question and I answer it myself. I ask the question only to emphasize. It doesn't mean that I want a response from you. That's what we call a rhetorical question. 
little lamb, who made thee? Who made thee? Who made thee? Hmm? Who made you, little lamb? Who made thee? He ponders about its origins. That is, he, 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 the child, ponders, ponders, wonders about his origin. That is the origin of the lamb. Okay, how it came into being, how the lamb came into being, how it acquired, right, its particular manner of feeling. It's a clothing of wool. It's tender voice. It's tender voice. My goodness. These are all characteristics of the lamb. And then we'll see the lamb again. What is it to say? In the next stanza, we've got two stanzas. That's all. The whole poem consists of two stanzas. Look at the second stanza. In the next stanza, the speaker answers his own question. That's what we mean by a rhetorical question. All right? A rhetorical question does not require anybody to answer the question, but it is an emphasis, and I will answer it myself. In other words, that is the child speaking. Okay? The next stanza, the speaker answers his own question. The lamb was made by one who who is this one calls himself a lamb too oh oh my goodness one who resembles in his gentleness both the child and the lamb now we've got a different speaker we've got a different speaker now okay now now Somebody else is commenting on both, on the lamb and on the child. Okay, the poem ends with the child giving a blessing on the lamb. How about that? Hmm? How about that? The child, the child leaves the ground and or the floor and gives it to a third, almost a third uh, speaker who is not the lamb and who is not the child. The image of the child is also associated with Jesus, with, with Jesus. In the gospel, and you know, that's a holy book, uh, part of the Bible, okay, part of the Bible, Jesus, this plays a special consideration for children. We notice that. And the Bible's depiction of Jesus in his childhood shows him as honest and vulnerable. My goodness. So this is again. That is the reason why songs of innocence depict, okay? People who ever come under the innocence here are vulnerable people, easy, easy manipulated, easy, easily exploited by others. So the poem, like many of the songs, this poem in particular, like many of the songs of innocence, accepts what Blake viewed as the more positive aspects of conventional. Christian belief. This is the conventional Christian belief. Okay? Innocence. Innocence. Right? Okay. Let us move now. The poem, again, is typified as romantic. Now, if I ask you in general, what is it? What is it typified as? Romantic. The language simple the style direct the meaning serious very serious symbolizing a harmony between the lamb man god and nature 
this is a very interesting combination of all of these symbolizing imagine the the poem itself symbolizing a harmony between all these one two three four the lamb the man god and nature all right and we have them all all of them done a, a great a great uh, justice by the poet here and by this poem all right then we move on we will move on now to <clears throat> the next paragraph here comes here comes the uh, difference between the first attitude and the attitude after the fall of adam and eve it can also be said that the child is a symbolic and eve in the innocent form before the fall from heaven to earth all right again that's another characteristic and that's another tribute uh, given to us by this poem it can also be said that the child is a symbolic image of adam and eve i'm repeating here and that is symbolic of them when before the fall blake's theory of childhood is a very important one in the sense what in the sense that you know very much affected very much influenced very much uh, 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 delighted in fact by the presence of the swiss uh, 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 you know he's speaking french i'm talking about about jean jacques rousseau a swiss born uh, french uh, artist and philosopher okay his theory of childhood stressed the notion that the child is born with a mind like a white sheet of paper a white sheet of paper who said that well we'll see i mentioned him who is he jean jacques rousseau that is the child is born without experience exactly of course well he's got the experience from okay only his innocence that speaks for him yet he does not stay in the same state of course not of course not there is the society, okay? He learns from every moment till he becomes mature man. He learns. He's not going to continue to, to, to remain a child. He's not going to continue. In fact, one, one lecturer one day was talking and he said that he, he began his he began his career as a teacher with with middle school middle school begins from 9 to 13. middle school begins from 9 to 13 in england okay and he tells us i remember when he was speaking in his lecture he tells us that is the that is the age where you need to see the the the, the, the way the child is behaving the way the child is getting into an an era a time where he is changing completely changing he is becoming okay he is coming into not adulthood but 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 what do we call it hmm? huh? what do we call it okay teenage age the teenage time everything changes everything, even his voice changes everything changes in the child that is he is learning of course that you remember we said a sheet of paper that is white it is no longer white at all when you when you follow this child from age 9 to age 13 my goodness 
and he is he's getting into the teens. That's why I called it the teen, fourteen, the teen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen. That is the end of the teens. That is the end of the teens. That is the end of the teens and coming into puberty. Coming into puberty. Huh? Puberty. Look it up. Look it up if you don't know it. In the age of 18 and moving towards the 19th, where the puberty shows its head to everybody and then move into you know adulthood anyway so here is uh, uh, at this stage stage of the child uh, we call it the white sheet of paper is no longer there because he is learning every moment till the till he becomes a mature man end of the teens transforming from the stage of innocence into the stage of experience. All right. We get into the stage of experience where we meet the tiger. We meet the tiger. We are with the tiger. We are with the tiger. Now the poem of the tiger gives you completely a different attitude and, and a, a different a different uh, uh, light when we talk about painting and a different uh, tune when you talk about the music okay my goodness in this poem the tiger blake asks the same question huh don't forget that who made the ask the same question that he has previously asked in the land which is about the notion of creation who made the who made the there are many descriptions of the tiger in this book pay attention to this this is a really tough tough poem although i mean tough description of what it means to be a man of experience what it means to be a person with the whole experience represented by the tiger then uh, there are many descriptions of the tiger in this poem notice the spelling of the tiger t-y-g-e-r in red t-i-g-e-r in black that's the the modern uh, pronunciation of the tiger in the black. In this poem, his eyes are like small balls of fire. What? The eyes of the tiger. Where is the innocence? No more. His eyes like the small balls of fire. His heart, very strong very strong my goodness with a dread hand and a dread feet look at it look at the hand of the tiger look at the feet of the tiger dread 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 fear 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 his brain is wide wide brain that is why the tiger is one of the strongest and the cleverest animals okay strength physical but cleverness the brain cleverness the in, the intelligent aspect though of course intelligent is not given to the animal it is given to the human only but as i say he's a symbol all right cleverest considers one of the cleverest animals on earth all right here it is blake wonders 
the creator played the, 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 the poet himself he wonders whether the God who creates the lamb is the same who creates the tiger what do you what do you say to this sentence why is he why is he wondering is it is it the same God is it the same God who creates the lamb can it be the same God who creates who creates the, the lamb creates the tiger Oh, whoa, oh, oh, whoa, oh, oh, whoa, oh. whoa, So, so different creatures, so different creations, so different fields. Suggesting here, when we say he wonders, he is suggesting in his statement that there is no separation between good and evil. Now, oh, this is the problem. This is the bigger problem we are facing. We are facing something really strange, and everybody calls this poet a, 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 an insane, lunatic, okay, mad. How could it be no separation between good and evil? In other words, can you, can you appreciate good? without experiencing evil. What makes you, you see, evil does not eliminate good. In fact, it emphasizes good. That is, we understand the good through or passing by the evil. And some of us may be experiencing the evil by something happening to us illness sickness okay poverty okay a lot of things and then when we when we are okay when we are back again into our natural okay habitat natural form natural everything then we understand what it means to be good okay Good and evil, no, no separation between them. No separation. That is that is something that I would like you. I would like you really to contemplate. That is, how can I enjoy the sun of the day without experiencing? The darkness of night so day and night they are opposites they are opposites but they are what nothing really separates them one emphasizes the other one does not exclude the other but include the other okay that's why i would like you to really try to make some kind of uh what do we call it uh, now this is your homework when we meet next time the other how to understand the other how to meet the other okay tell me what does the other mean to you? What does it mean to you to face the other? Okay? So Blake wonders, we said, whether the God who creates the lamb is the same one who creates the tiger. And here is that he is suggesting is the same creator, okay? Who created one, created the other okay it, there is no separation no exclusion between good and evil between gentle and fierce gentle is the lamb fierce is the tiger yet they are the same 
made by the same creator. The creator is a mixture of the two. Whoa, whoa, whoa. The, the creator is a mixture of two. In other words, how do we mix them together? How could you put the lamb side by side with the tiger? I don't know. It is the idea which makes the poem a universal one. That is the universality of the poem. The poem is concluded with the three images. And I want you to emphasize that. Emphasize these three images. Okay? Listen to me. The poem is concluded with the three images that describe the myth of the fall. Myth of the fall, and you know why it is myth according to this poet. The Bible is a myth. Books are myths and you know, all of these are myths. And the fall of Adam and Eve is a myth when he and she and when they fell from heaven to earth. All right. So please, please, I want you and uh, think of your, your report. This is a very interesting topic for the report. Okay. The fall of Adam. And Eve from heaven to earth, one. And I want you, as I told you earlier, that is, you are going to make a report, not a report here. It's a, it's what we call it, a search. I want you to search me what it's called, the other. How do you, how do you, how do you see the other? The other man, the other woman. They're the girl, they're the boy, they're the student, okay? The other, the stranger. All right. The first image is associated with the tears. What? Fall, a fall, of course, the tears comes. The fall, the tears come here, that move from the eyes to the cheek. The, eye, the tears that move from the eyes to the cheek. Second image depicts the stars which fall. Of course, when we talk about the fall, the fall means the fall of tears from the eyes, going where? Going to the cheeks, the cheeks of the individual. What about the second? What about the second? The second image. The second image depicts the stars when they fall. The stars which fall from heaven to earth. We have that. These stars are called the meteor. The meteor. Okay? The meteor. Pay attention. We said that this is the second. Where is the third? And final one. The third image portrays the rain. See, we're talking of water. We're talking of water. Tears are waters. Okay, tears are water. Uh -huh. And again, yeah, the material, the stars when they fall. Okay, eventually, we don't know what happens to them. And then the rain. Okay, so this is it. The movement of these three images, tears, stars, and rain is just like the fall of Adam and Eve from heaven to earth. This is very interesting. This is a paper that I think some of you might think of, of uh, somehow, and down endorsing somehow somehow thinking about what is the fall of adam and eve uh, associated with the with the with, with the fall of, of, of tears and the, the fall of stars and the fall of the rain okay 
that is a very interesting image that we need to depict and to talk about. Now, William Blake's philosophy as depicted in the two poems. The philosophy that I told you at the time, his time, everybody, everybody considered him mad, insane, insane. Imagine, not sane, but insane, mad, lunatic. What is his philosophy? In these just small, little hmm, poems, the Lamb and the Tiger. Both Blake's The Lamb and the Tiger means means both poems. Both poems show what? They show us the two contrary states of a human soul. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. You know, I have to stop here. I have to pause a little bit and talk about contrary states, but they are what? Side by side. We're talking about the human soul, the human soul here. Contrary states of the human soul. In the first poem, Blake shows us what? Innocence. The soul is innocent, of course. While in the second one, he shows us how the, this innocence was what corrupted and destroyed my 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 goodness what corrupts the soul what corrupts the soul what destroys the soul tell me hmm? as i told you that's why he's he is called uh, somehow insane or somehow somehow lunatic. He say, tells us that experience corrupts the soul. So Blake, all human beings are, in some sense, the children of a divine father. Listen to this. Good and bad. We are all the children of a divine father. That is Christianity for Blake. Christianity is divinity. And divinity is exploited by experience, exploited by the church and the church uh, manipulators. All right. For Blake, all the human beings are, in some sense, see, he, he is not certain. In, and he is not in total, means in total, but in some sense, the children of a divine father. But experience, as long as, as soon as they enter into the experience era or phase, they destroy, I mean, I mean their experience, no, their innocence is, is, is destroyed and is, their innocence is gone. When I say phase, I'm not talking time. No, no. I'm talking a slice of, you know, one's age, one's time. Okay? And again, we move. Blake brings two sides. Once again, listen to it. Two hemispheres. Two hemispheres. The right hemisphere and the left hemisphere. Pay attention to this. Look at your brain. Look at, put your hands on your brain. You have right, you have right hemisphere and left hemisphere. Right hemisphere, see things in total. See thing, things in total. See things as they are, images. But the one in the left, no. See them, see them as pieces and put these pieces together to make the whole. But it's not like in the right hemisphere of the brain, no. And language, our language 
is in the right hemisphere of your brain and my brain and his brain and her brain. So Blake brings the two sides, the good and evil, right? To create a real man. You can't create a real man without the good and, and, and bad, without the good and evil in him. He has to have these two. That, that's why that's why he was called Jesus Christ. Jesus is the man, and Christ is the Lord, is God. Jesus is Christ, according to Christianity. He is called Jesus Christ because he combines man and God in him. Blake brings two sides, the good and evil, to create a real man who can regain paradise. Re listen to this. Regain, regain paradise. I shouldn't say again, because regain contains again in its own in its own uh, formation, who who can regain paradise after its loss by our father, Adam. Adam lost paradise when he fell to earth. That is why we say we have to have the two we have to have the two folks. We have to have the two together. All right? That is, we have to have the good and the bad. We have to have evil and good both, or good and evil both in us. Create, this is what makes of us a real human being who can regain paradise after the loss of it by our father Adam. This man for Blake is Jesus Christ. This is, this is the first time he says Jesus Christ. All the time through the bones we are to talking about, about Jesus, the man. But Jesus Christ combined the two, combined the two, man and God. All right? Here we go, and that is the end of our explanation.